Section 9 of The Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Goldie. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 12. Natural History. Birds. Part 1. Birds. In previous chapters of this book, we have discussed the evolution of animals in general, the inclined plane of behavior, and the everyday life of the body, and it has been necessary to make many references to birds. But there are good reasons for devoting a special chapter to this great class. Birds have entered closely into human life, and in manifold ways. They supply food, and they are the poet's symbols. Their feathers keep us warm at night, and the wing, the arrow of the bowman. Birds save the world from the continual menace of prolific insects, and they give the priest a basis for their auguries. To birds we must trace the enormous nitrate beds of Chile, which have fertilized the soil of half the world, and we may thank them, too, for a share in the impulse that has led man to his mastery of the air. Moreover, most birds are joys forever. Biologically regarded, birds are of supreme interest in their solution of the problem of flight, so different from that of insects, pterodactyls, and bats, in their variability and plasticity within a comparatively narrow range, and in their fascinating behavior with its remarkable blending of instinctive and intelligent activities. Millions of years ago, the evolution of birds from reptilian stock began, as has been already described in an early chapter of this work. At first sight, it is not easy to see any resemblance between birds and reptiles. The one group warm-blooded, conspicuously active, and gloriously beautiful. The other cold-blooded, often sluggish, but perhaps also beautiful in their way. What kinship can there be between the falcon in the sky and the lizard on the wall? The students of comparative anatomy answers that the evidence of similarity are overwhelming. Bone by bone, the two creatures are built up on a plan that is certainly to a very great extent the same, however much the final products may be modified and adopted. Without much preliminary study of anatomical structure, these points might be difficult to apprehend and appreciate, and we cannot discuss them here. We must accept the verdict of the experts, and admit that birds are the descendants of a reptilian stock, not necessarily of any present-day group of reptiles, but rather of a common ancestor in the immensely remote past. Just one simple point of similarity between the two groups may be mentioned, the fact that both lay eggs, and eggs which are indeed closely alike in several respects, the dawn of bird life. We may imagine the ancestral forms as small lizard-like animals making the first beginnings of the kind of life which we see to great perfection in the birds of today. Real power of flight would be at first be absent among these early ancestors, but we may think of it as foreshadowed by a great power of leaping from branch to branch in the trees of the primeval forest, where these far-off ancestors of our birds had taken refuge from their terrestrial enemies. We may picture them as making the most of their arboreal hunt, probably using holes in the tree trunks in which to hide and to lay their eggs, and gradually developing a greater and greater agility and moving about above ground in search of food and in escape from such enemies as were still able to molest them. This mode of life would tend generation after generation to produce strong propelling hind limbs together with fore limbs armed with hook-like claws useful for taking hold at the end of each jump and for more leisurely clamoring at other times. The crucial step in the evolution of the true bird stock, however, must have been the acquisition of powers of real flight. At an early stage, the forelimbs would be held out sideways during each leap, and later the surface area would become enlarged by the development of a fold of skin between each of these limbs and the body. 
Later yet, this fold would become still more important, and its area would be still further increased by the transformation of its covering scales into some primitive form of feather. Longer and longer leaps would become possible from branch to branch and from tree to tree, as these aids to gliding flight improved. Finally, the last great step would be taken when a beginning was made of the active use of the primitive wings to prolong still further until the last indefinitely the distances possibly by leaping and gliding alone. It is a curious history, this tale of the origin of birds. In the first place, we seem to see the earliest ancestors as a feeble reptilian race driven from the ground and taking refuge among the branches. There followed ages of arboreal life during which the great adaptation of flight originated and was made perfect. Then came a day when the new race of birds fortified with the great advantage of mastery of the air spread abroad from the forests to reconquer the ground level, to find their bread upon the waters, to cross the seas to distant isles, and to defy the rigours of climate by their ability to change their season in a night. So today we have birds propelling the whole earth and filling every land with this abundant beauty of their plumage and their song and with the immense wonder of their eager spirited lives. Flightless birds. It is a strange side issue too to find that the priceless gift of flight has not always been preserved over and over again since the reconquest of the ground level there have been birds which have discarded the faculty which was the making of their race over and over again also they have paid the extreme penalty sometimes size and strength sometimes an aquatic life sometimes an island home has been the factor giving security in place of flights but with new conditions the exchange has frequently proved to be unfortunate too often in recent cases the new condition has been the advent of modern man and his civilization. Several flightless species are indeed numbered among the birds which have become extinct within historic times. Among the Maoris of New Zealand there was a traditional knowledge of a giant running bird which they called Moa, but which they had exterminated before the arrival of white men. From the bones and other remains which have been found in some quantity, the birds appear to have been large members of the ostrich tribe, one species standing twelve feet in height. A related bird of similar history was the Pyomis of Madagascar, which forms the subject of the delightfully imaginative story by Mr. H. G. Wells. This bird is sometimes identified with the legendary rock of the Arabian Nights. Not only its remains, but also its eggs have been found, and an egg in the British Museum Natural History measures more than 13 inches in length and 9.5 inches in breadth. The dodo. Extinct as the dodo has become a proverbial expression. The saying refers to a bird allied to the pigeons about the size of a swan and of clumsy and uncouth appearance. It was quite flightless and lived in security in Mauritius until the island was visited by Dutch sailors in the 16th century. The hogs which these men brought with them were largely responsible for the subsequent rapid extermination of the birds, and now the dodo is known only from some remains in museums and from the quaint drawings and descriptions of the early voyagers. The Ostrich Tribe among the birds of the present day, the ostrich tribe and the penguins are the principal examples of flightlessness. The ostrich and its kin are for most part birds of large size, possessing a soft hair-like plumage, diminutive wings, and strong legs. They are capable of running at great speed across open country, and also of kicking with suddenness and force. Their breastbones lack the pronounced keel, which is so noticeable in most birds, and which serves for the attachment of the great muscles for working the wings in flight. Best known, of course, is the African ostrich now being domesticated by man for the sake of its plumes. But there are also several kinds of American ostriches or rheas in South America, and of cassowaries and emus in Australasia. Unlike their fellows are the kiwis of New Zealand, birds of no great size, timid and nocturnal in habit. Their long beaks and their hair-like plumage combine to give an exceedingly quaint appearance, and there are no visible wings. 
penguins. The penguins are rather a different case, for their wings have by no means fallen into disuse. They have become instead adapted for swimming. There are many different kinds, but all belong to the southern hemisphere, and most of them to the far south. Many Antarctic explorers have brought back tales of their lives, but it is to Dr. Murray Levick, who was with Terra Nova in 1910, that we owe one of the best accounts relating particularly to the Adelie penguin. These flightless birds will return over hundreds of miles of trackless sea to the same rookeries year after year to breed. Dr. Levick describes how the first penguin arrived at the rookery at Cape Adare toward the middle of October, the southern spring, and how four days later the birds were coming in across the still unbroken sea ice in such numbers that they formed a line stretching northward as far as the eye could see. Within a month, the colony was some three-quarters of a million strong. The Adelie penguin builds a large nest of stones, the only material available, and the uses of this are evident when the thaw comes and the ground is covered with water and slush. In this nest, two large eggs are laid, and one of the parents goes off to the sea to feed, while the other remains to incubate. The bird which leaves may be away for a week or ten days, and the other may therefore not break its fast for as much as four weeks in all. I know of no other creature, says Mr. Herbert G. Pooting, from which man may learn a finer lesson of how resolution and steadfastness may overcome every difficulty than from the Adelie penguin. Their bravery is amazing. No blizzard, however violent, will drive these birds from their nests in the wild Antarctic regions. Mr. Pooting relates that they are found sitting on their nests buried deep in the snow, wondering where the birds had disappeared to after a blizzard he set out to investigate. As I was struggling about, wondering whether my penguin investigation has come to an abrupt end, I was almost scared out of my life by a muffled squawk and felt something wiggling under my foot. I had stepped on the back of a sitting penguin buried nearly two feet deep in the snow. As the victim struggled out, loudly protesting its wrath at this outrage, we were convulsed with laughter, then roused by our noisy mirth. Scores of black heads with guang eyes suddenly protruded from the snow to see what all the fuss was about. That is how we discovered them. They had not deserted the place, but were attending to their domestic duties, under the snow, patiently waiting for it to blow away. There were penguins everywhere. It was impossible to walk without stepping on them. The penguins are fond of all manner of amusements, leaving their young under the protection of a few of the old birds. Most of the parents go off to disport themselves on the ice or in the water. They will string out behind a leader and make for the near ice flows, the party sometimes purposing along the way, then toboganning over the ice. They followed in a line behind the leader, doing exactly as he did. The fun became fast and furious, and I suppose they got a bit winded, for after a while the courier gave them a rest. Following his lead, they sprang onto an ice raft, then still imitating his example, they settled down on their breasts and basks a while in the sunshine, prior to doing a few more laps. That they all thoroughly enjoyed the game, there could be no possible doubt. The emperor penguin is the largest species and may stand over four feet high. Unlike the Adelie, its nest or rather lays its single egg on the sea ice itself, and it is remarkable for breeding in midwinter. Incubation lasts for as much as six or seven weeks, but the task is shared not only by both parents but by the strangely large number of barren birds living in the colony. The chick has the rather doubtful advantage of a number of foster parents, all desirous of participating in its care, a strange condition of things which was well described by Dr. A. E. Wilson, who afterwards shared Scott's tragic fate on the return journey from the Pole. What we actually saw again and again was the wild dash made by a dozen adults, each weighing anything up to ninety pounds, to take possession of any chicken that happened to find itself deserted on the ice. It can be compared to nothing better than a football scrimmage, in which the first bird to seize the chick is hustled and worried on all sides, while it rapidly tries to push the infant between its legs with the help of its pointed beak, shrugging up the loosened skin of the abdomen the while to cover it. That no great care is taken to save the chick from injury is obvious from the examination of the dead ones lying on the ice. All had rents and claw marks in the skin, and we saw this not only in the dead, but the living. 
the chicks are fully alive to the inconvenience of being fought for by so many clumsy nurses, and I have seen them not only make the best use of their legs in avoiding such attentions, but remain to starve and freeze in preference to being nursed. Undoubtedly, I think, that of the seventy-seven percent that die before they shed their down, quite half are killed by kindness. Flying Birds with this strange and rather terrible picture of the early life of the emperor penguin amid the rigours of the Antarctic climate and on the naked ice of the frozen sea, we may turn from flightless to flying birds. The flightless birds indeed represent digressions from the main line of descent and cannot be regarded as stages in the evolution of modern flying birds from the ancient forms which first mastered flight in the forest of long ago. Birds share with mammals the distinction of being warm-blooded, that is to say, having a high and constant body temperature independent of surrounding conditions. We may take this as an index of a high degree of vitality and of an advanced position in the evolutionary scale, and we shall indeed find many other features which lead toward the same conclusion. Birds are noteworthy for alertness of mind and body, for quickness of movement, and for their mastery of the air. They have highly developed habits and complex instincts. They are in turn combative, amatory, parental, cunning in pursuit and escape, and in very many cases there is a surpassing beauty of plumage and voice which compels our intense admiration. Least is one of these words of variable and confused sense which drive men of science to use a language of their own. But the term bird scarcely needs to be defined, for its everyday meaning is also scientifically accurate. This fact may perhaps be attributed to the existence of certain very distinctive characteristics common to all birds, and to a large measure of uniformity and general appearance among the nearly 20,000 different species which are known to science. There are, it is true, wide differences in size, in coloration, and in manner of life, but there are no gross divergences in form comparable to those found, for instance, among mammals between the tiger and the goat, the kangaroo and the elephant, or the bat and the whale. This distinctiveness and this uniformity may both be accommodated for, in one word, flight. The whole body of the bird is adapted to this habit of flying. The bird's skeleton is a wonderful study from this point of view, but here it, but here it will suffice to mention the external features. Flight has brought with it feathers, and these are a unique feature. All birds have feathers, and nothing that is not a bird possesses any trace of them. Furthermore, the function of flight has secured a virtual monopoly over the four limbs, and it has thus brought two other striking adaptations in its train. A bird is of necessity a biped, walking on its two hind limbs, and its mouth has had to take the place of a hand, thus leading to the evolution of a long flexible neck and of a hard beak, which is often wonderfully adapted to the feeding habits of the particular species. The flight of birds. Birds are, of course, true, heavier than air machines, and in former days man used to strive to learn their secret for the purposes of the flying machines which his heart desired. But within the last few years the main physical principles of the airplane have become so familiar that we may perhaps reverse the process by using them in the description of our present problem. Just as gliders preceded airplanes, so gliding flight may, as we have seen, have been the beginning of the mastery of the air in the case of birds. And it is in gliding that the artificial machine and the bird are most alike. In both cases, advantage is taken of the resistance of the air and of the consequent upward tendency imparted to a body moving horizontally and having a flat inclined in their surface. When we come to active flight, a difference is at once obvious. The airplane propellers supply a motive force independently of the plane, while in the birds the wings are both propellers and planes at the same time. There is indeed a further difference in that the airplane's propellers during level flight at least exert force purely in a horizontal direction, the lifting force being wholly due, as in gliding, to air resistance. 
in the bird the wing strokes themselves supply part of the lifting power as well as propelling the body forwards nor must we forget the bird's tail which plays a part in steering and balancing as in the case of the airplane rudder it is also often used as a brake without which many a swiftly pouncing bird of prey would be apt to dash itself to destruction on the ground some of the larger birds are adept at soaring and can remain in the air for a long time with motionless wings and can even rise in slow spiral ascent to a great height the late mr f w Headley, a keen and exact student of the flight of birds came to the conclusion that this feat was inexplicable except on the supposition that the advantage was taken of up currents in the air the bird's actual motion being merely a gliding one he pointed out that gulls are adepts at this when flying above the edge of a cliff but that they cannot do it at sea whereas aviators and air travellers know there are not the vertical disturbances caused by the varying ground level temperature and by the changing elevation of dry land another feat namely hovering is familiar in the hunting method of the kestrel which maintains a stationary position for an appreciable time against a strong wind it would be easy to maintain a ground speed of nil and it would be possible even with motionless wings in still air however the ordinary gliding basis of flight is in abeyance and altitude must be maintained by sheer vertical force of wing stroke the bird being thus more nearly equivalent to a helicopter than to an airplane speed and altitude the aviators of today compete to establish records for speed for endurance and for altitude how do birds stand in these respects as regards to speed in the first place one must remember the difference between ground speed and air speed both the airplane and the bird can for a certain expenditure of power attain a certain velocity in the body of air in which they are but the velocity as measured from the ground may be a very different thing thus an airplane travelling at a hundred miles per hour in a twenty mile per hour wind may seem from ground to be going at a hundred and twenty miles or at eighty miles per hour accordingly as it flies with or against the air stream so also of course with the bird all our speed records of birds except a few made from airplanes are necessarily in terms of ground speed and in many cases the particulars necessary for a wind correction are unhappily wanting what are some of the actual figures the available evidence has recently been summarized by colonel meinzargen with special reference to speed during migration he concludes that a bird has an ordinary pace which is the one used in migratory flight and an accelerated pace of which it is capable for a short distance under stress of danger or in other special circumstances here are some of his figures carrier pigeons thirty to thirty six miles per hour over sixty have been recorded but possibly only with a strong favorable wind crows thirty one to forty five small songbirds twenty to thirty seven starlings thirty eight to forty nine ducks forty four to fifty nine he also quotes the case of a flock of swifts flying at six thousand feet above mosul in mesopotamia which in their ordinary flight easily outpaced the observer's airplane when it was doing sixty eight miles per hour the air speed of this astonishing flyer is when accelerated probably well over a hundred miles an hour as regards altitude it seems that all the birds have occasionally been recorded as high as fifteen thousand feet they are indeed rarely met with above five thousand feet while the greater part of flight including migration probably takes place within three thousand feet of the ground the power of flight has given birds the key to one kind of habitat after another that might otherwise have proved to be too dangerous or too inhospitable to the conditions of these different haunts and in particular to different modes of procuring food we see a great wealth of adaptation there are hunters and fishers catchers of insects and harvesters of seeds eaters of crustaceans and eaters of worm plant eaters and honey suckers scavengers of carrion and many a picker up of inconsidered trifles End of section 9 Birds
of the Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Goldie. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 12. Birds, Part 2. The Hunting of the Peregrine pride of place may be given to the hunters, and, as a type of them to the peregrine falcon, described by the late Professor Alfred Newton, as the most powerful bird for its bulk that flies. It is a strong, fierce bird, with long pointed wings, spending no time on its comings and goings, and dealing death in mid-air with relentless talons. In spite of game-preserving, it still maintains its place as one of the most splendid of native British birds. Its prey consists mainly of other birds, and these it attacks in flight, stooping away from above, and killing not by force of impact, but by the sheer grip of its claws. Having arrived within a few feet of its prey, wrote Audubon, of the almost identical duck hawk of America, the falcon is seen protruding his powerful legs and talons to their full stretch. His wings are for a moment almost closed. The next instant he grapples to the prize, which, if too weighty to be carried off, he forces obliquely to the ground, sometimes a hundred yards from where it was seized, to kill it and devour it on the spot. Should this happen over a large extent of water, the falcon drops his prey and sets off in quest of another. On the contrary, should it not prove too heavy, the exulting bird carries it off to a sequestered and secure place. A peregrine can indeed carry a weight almost equal to its own, and a pair nesting on the bass rock in the Firth of Forth have been known to bring grouse and pheasants from the mainland across two or three miles of sea. The peregrine falcon belongs to the aristocracy of the bird world. It has a haughty stare, a regal dignity, is absolutely fearless, and has great reserve power, and, as Mr. Hudson says, possesses a courage commensurate with its strength, and in hunting an infallible judgment. It is one of the most perfect of wind's creatures, so well balanced in all parts so admirably adapted for speed, strength, and endurance. The lordly falcon is the terror of the skies. Sooner or later, the day always comes in early autumn to birdland, when the peewits feeding in silent battalions together, and the gulls, watching impatiently to rob the peewits of their worms, suddenly arise and wheel in wild disorder to the horizon when the clustered partridge conveys crouch like clods to the earth and the flocks of small birds feeding in the open flinging themselves like a shower of stones into the nearest hedge when the blackbird issuing from cover turns before he has flown a yard and darts back again with a chatter of alarm when save for the distant cawing of rooks perched on lookout trees a parish apart, sudden perfect stillness holds the landscape. Then the peregrine falcon passes, smiting her way from horizon to horizon and spreading terror as she goes. Who gave the first warning of her coming? It is hard to tell. Possibly it was a rook. But the marvel is that the majority of the birds, being young ones of the year, can never have seen a falcon before, yet they fling themselves wildly to right and to left long before to speck in the far skies reveals itself to humans as a bird of prey. The golden eagle is the largest of our native birds of prey. The well-known lines of Tennyson spring to mind. He clasps the crag with crooked hands, close to the sun in lonely lands. Ringed with the azure world, he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. He watches from his mountain walls, and like a thunderbolt he falls. The golden eagle looks well after its young, feeding them at dawn and dusk each day. The grouse that are brought to the eaglet are plucked and headless. The hares and rabbits are skinned and made ready in a larder distant from the nest. The youngsters get only digestible food, being unable for some weeks to form pellets. 
the eaglets are taught how to hunt and how to kill as well as how to carry and skin their prey when they are about five months old they are driven away the fishing of the cormorant very different from the habits of these birds of prey is the underwater hunting of the cormorant a bird of much less noble habits and aspects which is notable for clumsiness in the air and for uncouth appearance on land as well as for the foul stenches of its untidy nest under the water however it is the thing of beauty so perfectly adapted is it to the swift and dexterous pursuit of its active prey in a tank with glass slides we may see this to great advantage and note how the wings are kept close to the body not used for swimming as in the case of penguins and auks and how the air bubbles cling to the feathers like bright jewels or polished silver we can see too how the strong hooked beak is used to seize the fish which is then borne to the surface to be tossed in the air recaught and swallowed for the cormorant does not swallow under water like a penguin the chinese train cormorants to catch fish from the market a collar round the neck preventing the birds from swallowing their prizes the same thing was done in britain at one time although only for sport different fishing methods it is interesting to compare the different methods of fishing adopted by two of the cormorant's relatives the gannet and the pelican and the different forms of beak which go with each the gannet or so-called solen goose nests in great colonies on several of the rocky islets around the british coast and it may also be seen at most tunes off many parts which are far from these breeding stations it is a bird of fine white plumage and noble flight which soaring at a height and then suddenly dropping like a plummet uses its long straight beak to transfix fish swimming near the surface the pelican again is a fisher of the shallows which wades through the water with its enormous gape at full extent and the great pouch below its beak ready to receive what comes a party may work in concert sweeping the pool in a long line like a living seine net the cormorant pursues, twists, turns, and seizes. The gannet soars, plunges, and spears. The pelican sweeps and engulfs. The Wisdom of the Raven We may refer here to the raven. Like some of the larger birds of prey, the raven takes a wife for life, and they use the same nest year after year. As an inland bird, the raven is now not so frequently met with for it has been driven by persecution from many of its former mountain hunts luckily it is one of the hardiest of birds and can adapt itself to the great extremes of temperature the raven the biggest of our crows is the brainiest of all our birds his family are the great legal fraternity among birds nimbleness of wit mingled with audacity characterize them all so that the very first time that i observed the hoodie crow at home i was struck with his laughable resemblance to a barrister in a wig and gown there was the same keen eye for the shortcomings of others and the general look of mental superiority to ordinary folk the raven has the reputation of being one of the longest-lived birds it enjoys a reputation also for mimicry if you climb to its roosting place on some mountain precipice you may hear in the silence of the hills how the ravens croon themselves to sleep uttering reminiscence of the sounds they have been listening to throughout the day mr f b kirkman in the british bird book writes from the growing congregation to the ridge there descended through the thickening dust the strangest of even songs a weird wild medley of many sounds the barking of dogs the bleating of goats the lowing of cows the becking of grouse calling across the moorland and now and then the deep belling challenge of the stag their intelligence is almost uncanny and when we think that they are of savage character and have a deep harsh human like voice we can imagine some explanation of the evil reputation of the bird and the sombre superstitions associated with it social life it has to be confessed that we have a great deal to learn about the inner life of birds 
it is difficult to get mentally in touch with them they have evolved on a different plane from our own our sense of kinship with animals is still something novel but it is ever widening and deepening as we view it more closely with a clearer vision may we not claim this is one of the steps in the progress of evolution with birds as with mammals there are many phases of social life some species of birds are more social in their relationship than others in some there is a more advanced state of community than others with individuals there may exist mutual friendship companionship between two birds of the same species or even between birds of different species is often seen the helping instinct is characteristic in birds as in other animals it is often touchingly human-like we see it most often in parental care and in the feeding of each other by the sexes but it is shown frequently in other ways mr w h hudson speaking of the military starling of the pampas a bird of social disposition tells this story one day I was sitting on my horse, watching a flock feeding and traveling in their leisurely manner, when I noticed a little distance behind the others a bird sitting motionless on the ground, and two others keeping close to it, one on each side. These two had finished examining the ground and prodding at the roots of the grass at the spot, and were now anxious to go forward and rejoin the company, but were held back by the other one. On my going to them, they all flew up and on, and I then saw that the one that had hung back had a broken leg. Perhaps it had not been long broken, and he had not yet accommodated himself to the changed conditions in which he had to get about on the ground and find his food. I followed and found that again and again after the entire scarlet-breasted army had moved on, the lame bird remained behind his two impatient but faithful companions still keeping with him they would not fly until he flew and when on the wing still kept their places on his side and in overtaking the flock all three would drop down together as mr hudson says it is possible to mistake for friendship an action which at all events in its origin is of a different nature instances of such altruistic behavior to be attributed to the helping instinct of animals of social habits are common mr frank finn relates that the upper bill of a huia an insectivorous birds of new zealand by some accident or natural deformity has grown into the shape of a corkscrew and it was not apparent how it could get enough food to support life naturally it seems it had been fed for some time by a devoted mate the social habit the development of a social habit at the breeding season is a well-marked characteristic of many kinds of birds and it is by no means confined to those which are gregarious at other times conversely it is also true that some birds which at other seasons band together are among the least social at this special time more than one factor is probably involved the scarcity of suitable sites for marsh fowl for example may be a reason for concentration in special spots and strength of defense against enemies may often be an advantage gained in other cases the problem of food supply will tend to produce distribution rather than concentration and this is especially the case with many of the smaller species of our common birds among warblers for example there is a marked tendency for a pair to select a small territory within which they will remain and from which they will endeavor to exclude all other members of their own species and even in due course their own young many birds like human beings would seem to enjoy the company of their kind the gregarious habit is common for example among rooks starlings pigeons swallows parrots roam in bands apparently for the pleasure of one another's company we may have crowds and associations however without sociability a community of separate individuals may exist without there being any corporate life or power of acting as a unity still we do see many instances of a capacity for unified action and distinct features of a social life there appears to be an intellectual advantage in sociability if we may argue from the fact that many social animals show a high development of wits the three cleverest kinds of birds are rooks cranes and parrots and they are notably social 
there is of course the danger of putting the cart before the horse for it may be that the sociability is in part the expression of good brains it may also be argued that the non-gregarious crow is just as clever as the social rook many analogous instances may be given the rook is the best example of our gregarious birds there is no doubt that the members of the crow family have fine brains and great power of vocalization which may develop to a more remarkable extent experts tell us that the rook has a command of between thirty and forty notes to learn to what extent they employ them one has to only listen to the black republic in the elms after the breeding season is over Professor J. Arthur Thompson, in Secrets of Animal Life, says, Like many creatures well endowed with brains, rooks exhibit what must be called play. There are gambles and sham fights, frolics and wild chases, in which, curiously enough, jackdaws and lapwings sometimes become keenly interested. But who knows the real truth about the rooks posing sentinels, which is so often alleged? who knows the significance of the vast congregations that are sometimes seen and who can tell us if there is any truth at all in the alleged trials of individuals who have defied the conventions of the community but the central interest is in the rooks reaching forward to a communal life with certain conventions and to the crowded nest in which we see the beginning of a continuous social heritage of objectively and registered traditions there may be far over a thousand nests in a rookery and the same site may be used for more than a century rooks certainly have a considerable vocabulary there is not indeed any language in the strict sense man has a monopoly of that but the rooks have words just as dogs have definite uttered sounds which have definite meanings we hear the rooks use certain words when we move suddenly beneath the trees and other words are uttered when a bird intrudes on its neighbor there is a word for when the rook sinks down upon the nest and another word when it flies clear of the rookery and makes for the fields what danger signals what scoldings what chucklings what exultation what reproaches what encouragement do we not hear mutual protection mr w p pycraft in his history of birds says among gregarious species some display a much more intimate association than others are more social in their relationships and this is shown very clearly in the devices which some species have adopted for their mutual protection during sleep the common partridge as is well known lives in a small companies or coves which scatter only while feeding and then not far enough to be beyond call later in the day as soon as the beetles begin to buzz says professor newton the whole move away together to some spot where they jug as it is called that is squat and nestle close together for the night and from the appearance of the mutings or droppings which are generally deposited in a circle of only a few inches in diameter it would appear that the birds arrange themselves also in a circle of which their tails from the centre all the heads being outward a disposition which instinct has suggested as the best for observing the approach of any of their numerous enemies whatever may be the direction and thus increases their security by enabling them to avoid a surprise ducks similarly take special precautions to secure safety during sleep when this must be taken in exposed situations as when for example they desire to doze between the intervals of feeding during the night which they pass afloat at such times they keep close together and to avoid drifting ashore keep one leg slowly paddling and thus drive themselves round in circles there is sometimes cooperation in hunting as we have already noted in the case of pelicans which combine in a crescent and wading shorewards drive the fish before them when they have got them cornered they fill their huge throat pouches it is said that a pair of golden eagles will occasionally hint in concert one beating the bushes while other flies overhead waiting to promise with birds as with other animals we see as we do in human beings that some individuals are gifted above others of their kind a few may have a keener sense a greater strength or power of leadership a more helpful spirit than their fellows 
this counts for much in a social state the action of the gander and of the trumpeter in driving their fellows home in the evening must be regarded as similar in its origin to that of the male swift when he hunts his mate back to the nest and of the sand martin i observe chasing the females of the colony to their burrows in a lesser way it may be seen in any flock of birds they move about in such an orderly manner springing as it appears to us simultaneously into the air going in a certain direction settling here or there to feed presently going to another distant feeding ground or alighting to rest or sing on the trees and bushes as to produce the idea of a single mind but the flock is not a machine the minds are many one bird gives the signal and one who is a little better in his keener sense and quicker intelligence than his companions his slightest sound his least movement is heard and seen and understood and is instantly and simultaneously acted upon interrelations many curious associations are formed by birds during the breeding season the pufin is quite capable of making a hole for itself in the face of some precipitous slope but frequently it prefers to appropriate a rabbit's burrow ejecting the rightful owner without ceremony other burrowing birds are often more accommodating for the burrowing owls of america live amicably with the prairie dogs whose retreats they so often share and in new zealand the same holes are shared by petrels and tuatera lizards without apparent friction in cases of this kind however it is always possible that the partnership has other advantages such as common defence or watchfulness than the mere saving of labour on the one hand or on the other there is a curious case for instance of the ruddy kingfisher of borneo which makes its nest in the hive of a peculiarly vicious kind of bee end of section ten birds recording by goldie eleven of the outline of science volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 12. Birds, Part 3. Our Common Birds. The late Professor Newton has an interesting passage in which he shows that we can tell which birds were most familiar to our forefathers by their having a pet name added thus the daw is the jackdaw the red breast is robin the wren is jenny the pie is magpie the mag being short for margaret in early prints of ploughing the closeness of the connection between men and bird is naively pictured in one of the earliest illustrations of sewing for instance the birds crowd so closely on the heel of the sower that they had to be driven off with stones or even whips and they are seen springing beyond the leap of a small dog that has been sent to chase them in modern times the charms possessed by the birds is partly that of friendship but more that of delight in their songs and feathers the following birds form only a few examples chosen for some special interest the nightingale it has often been disputed whether the nightingale's songs is really the sweetest it certainly owes something to the stage on which it is set for when the bird arrives the field and garden arc gay with spring flowers the cuckoo arrives just about the same time it sings all day but the nightingale mostly in the evening and the sweetness of his note is enhanced by the light of stars and the scent of blossom whether it is a melancholy or a merry song has long been disputed it certainly is not loud because when the nightingale sings by day it is not noticed amid the clamour of other bird music mr w h hudson says its phrasing is more perfect than that of any other british melodist and the voice has a combined strength purity and brilliance probably without a parallel the blackbird and the song thrush the blackbird's voice is remarkable for its great strength and for the wonderful rich quality of its tone 
he is a clever mimic like several other songsters and has been heard to imitate the nightingale's song with some measure of success there are several recorded instances too of his crowing exactly domestic cock apparently enjoying the sound of the responses made by the fowls of the neighboring farmyard and of his crackling like an egg-proud hen some prefer the song of the blackbird to that of the thrush it certainly is the sweeter of the two but it is not so long continued it may vary with the district and some hold that the surrey blackbird is the sweetest songster of his kind the period of song is identical with the visit of the most delicately beautiful of all butterflies the orange tipped even the little song thrush a close relative of the blackbird is a louder and more persistent singer than the latter although in that respect he does not compete with the larger missile thrush which can often be heard pouring out his bold loud notes from the topmost twig of a bare tree in the month of january the song is in keeping with his character mr w h hudson thinks that the Throstel is by far the finest songster. His chief merit is his infinite variety. His louder notes may be heard half a mile away on a still summer morning. His lowest sounds are scarcely audible at a distance of twenty yards. His purest sounds, which are very pure and bright when contrasted with the various squealing and squeaking noises, seem not to come from the same bird. As a rule, when he has produced a beautiful note, he will repeat it twice or thrice, while the blackbird is cunning and secret in his way, creeping round the roots of the yews and other shrubs, the thrush boldly roams across the fields. The lark, the songster most closely associated with farmlands, is undoubtedly the lark. He is the earliest rising of all the birds, and when in full voice he is just about the time when the young wheat is tall enough to cover him, he may be heard pouring out his song before sunrise. He is not one to confine his charms to his courting days, but he has been heard in every month of the year except September, his moulting time. It is in spring and early summer, however, that he pours forth his best music. The song has words for it in the folklore of many countries, and the following rhyme succeeds in conveying an idea of it. To wit, to wit, to we, no shoemaker can bake boots for me. Why so? Why so? Why so? Because my heel's as long as my toe, my toe. The wood pigeon. No voice is more closely associated with the beautiful wooded landscapes of England than the love song of the wood pigeon. According to an ancient legend, the words it tries to say are Taktukus, Paddy, the legend being that in the golden age the wood pigeon lays its eggs on the grass, but they were trampled upon by two cows. An Irishman led one away, and the wood pigeon pays in vain for him to take to the other, to which the partridge is supposed to reply, "De you take it? A wonderfully close imitation of its apology for a song. The little dove, the turtle dove, or the crudling dove, has a sweet short song that fits in well with the whisper of the summer leaves. It is an old country saying that when you first hear the crudling of the little doe, then it is time to sow your swedes the bullfinch and the goldfinch one has often wondered if there is a manner of accounting for the different marital qualities that characterize birds take the cock partridge and you find a model father one that will stand up to anything in defence of his young while the cock pheasant is a very gay lothario the most faithful of our birds is the bullfinch. The male and female do not only stick together during the breeding season, as is the case with most birds, but along the lanes in winter you may see the male and female picking up morsels of food on the black hedgerows. They do not keep close together, but never go out of hearing of one another. And it is very easy to imagine words for the conversation which they keep up. The goldfinch is perhaps the most beautiful of all the feathered folk in the English landscape. In autumn it is a very pretty sight to see a little cluster of them feeding on thistledown and performing the most delicate acrobatic feats in balancing themselves so as to pick from the plant. A few woodlanders, 
variety of character in birds is nowhere more marked than among the more familiar inhabitants of the woodland take the jay clean made bright coloured with a voice that is raucous but seems always in tune with the noise which the wind makes blowing through the tall trees he is a gentleman in appearance but his flight is as awkward as the gait of a yokel moreover nature has endowed him with a thieving and lawless character he steals the eggs from the nest and makes a meal of any fledglings that he can lay hold of yet he is very cunning about concealing himself during the breeding season when he has to think of the safety of the family as well as his own for the time being the loud cry is stilled and the bird on being disturbed shifts slyly and quietly from one tree to another he has a natural genius for concealing his nest and in that way differs much from his relative the magpie whose idea of architecture is simply to pile woody twigs upon woody twigs so as to make a conspicuous and monstrous habitation the magpie used to be a favorite domestic pet but its numbers have now been greatly reduced so that to see several of them together which used to be considered very unlucky it is almost impossible in some districts they very often go in threes for some reason which we cannot explain the magpie can be taught to articulate a few words he is inquisitive and loquacious the usual sound emitted by the magpie is an exciting chatter a note with a hard percussive sound rapidly repeated half a dozen times it may be compared to the sound of a wooden rattle or to the bleating of a goat but there is always a certain resemblance to the human's voice in it especially when the birds are unalarmed and converse with each other in subdued tones the huron is a bird of the woodland in so far as it is there he makes his heronry it will frequently be found closely adjacent to a rookery but the two colonies do not always live at peace although in a case the writer knows of quite near london they have done so for many decades the rooks are numerous and aggressive and though an individual rook could not hold its own with a huron numbers usually prevail when a battle royal takes place in habit the huron is a bird of the brook and river and there can be little doubt about his favorite diet being a fish he loves to stand in a clear shallow stream apparently motionless but should an eel creep out or a boulder trout try to make a passage upstream the huron's keen eye sees it at once and down comes his beak like a sharp spear the chances being that the next experience of the fish is that of being borne through the air to be eventually swallowed and either wholly or partly digested in the latter case the process is stopped in order that the young may receive the food in a softened condition the green woodpecker is a common british species whose bright plumage is less conspicuous among the trees than might be thought but whose presence is often betrayed by the loud cry like a burst of demoniac laughter or by the strong tap 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 of its beak as it sounds the tree trunks for rotten portions where insects may be found the woodpecker's strong beak adopted to its mode of feeding is well suited also for the work of excavating a nesting hole and a deep cavity with a small horizontal opening at the top is hollowed out the water hen and the coot the water hen looks black at a distance but on closer observation discloses many charming shades of color it is a bird that seems to thrive and increase in numbers more than its companion the coot yet it nests often in a perilous position you may seek for the nest either among the rushes and flags or the border of a stream or on the long willow branches that stretch out closely to the surface of the water if they are not touching it country folk believe that in every normal year there is a may flood and when that comes the water very frequently lifts the nest of the water hen out of its mooring and carries it downstream the faithful bird will go a long distance in its curious little ship but it is compelled to vacate it at last as such floods carry down the branches of trees trunks that have been lying on the bank and a great deal of miscellaneous debris capable of wrecking the poor craft not that the water hen is likely to suffer personal injury as she will dive into the strongest running stream and escape scatheless the grebes the little grebe is to be met with on inland waters all the year round 
in winter it resorts to rivers and larger bodies of water when the small ponds beside which it often nests are apt to be frozen over its supreme accomplishment is that of diving and hiding itself among the stems of water plants or other cover it must of course come up but it is amusing to notice the length of time it will remain under the water and the distance it will often travel before it makes a second appearance the great crested grebe is one of the stateliest and most beautiful of our inland water birds visitors from the sea one of the most beautiful sights to be seen in this country is that of a colony of black-headed gulls nestling beside a lake or in swampy places far away from the sea coast and estuaries where they may be found in winter searching for small fishes or other food cast up by the tide in days of old their eggs were prized as food and even the young were taken but the modern palate does not set so much value on them the movements inland are made with great regularity the birds appearing at one gull pond of which we know about march twenty seven scarcely ever a day before or a day later they raise their young while the corncrake is singing its mournful and monotonous ditty in the new grass and the growing wheat a hill country attracts them because of the little streamlets which pro provide plenty of food they know as well as the angler does that the trout lie with their heads upstream waiting for any little tidbit in the shape of a worm or fly which the water brings down when the gulls are fishing one can watch them beating their way up past a succession of gravelly shells into which they occasionally dip for prey when they come to the end of the beat they fly back round the shoulder of the hill out of sight of the stream and resume operations where they started before birds of the moorland there is no prettier adjunct to a moorland or a bare field than a flock of lapwings they fly together and all right together in autumn of winter when not breeding but in nesting time they go in pairs though usually there are dozens and sometimes hundreds in the same field the bird is a simple creature in so far that its nest is little more than a slight hollow on the bare earth in spring they can be seen sitting on their eggs without making the slightest attempt at concealment so that the individual who goes out to collect their eggs need only march up to a sitting bird but if it rises he must keep his eye on the place from which it springs there never can be much doubt as to whether or not the nest is close because if it is the bird shriek and swoop at the intruder as if they were going for his head or eyes should an animal other than a man come they will indeed carry out the threat no sooner are the young out of their shells that they begin to run as if chased will select a hiding place it may be closed by stones as gray as themselves or in the short herbage which early spring brings with it a trained eye is needed to distinguish them from their surrounding even at a short distance the curlew haunts the seashore during the greater part of the year but in spring retires to some slack or valley in hilly country and makes a nest on the ground the situation is generally very lonely and the watchful birds quickly show themselves alive to the presence of a stranger usually their note is a monotonous and melancholy sound heard as it often is at night-time in the stillness of the moorland but we know of no other bird that makes the clamour the curlew does when its domestic privacy is invaded it flies up and down the valley shrieking to awaken the echoes and looking as if it would like to do something dreadful to the human who had ventured into its domain the snipe is the most difficult of indigenous game birds to shoot on account of its trick of half stopping and suddenly darting during the breeding season he performs curious antics in the air rising to a great height and then precipitating himself downward with astonishing violence producing in his descent the peculiar sound variously described as drumming bleeding scyther wetting and neighing the peculiar drumming sound was long the subject of controversy but recent observation have made it clear that it is due to the vibration of the two outer tail feathers which have a peculiar structure 
the cuckoo the cuckoo is well known not only builds no nest of its own but foists its eggs on other species and has its young reared without trouble to itself but to the great detriment of the rightful children of the foster parents the story indeed is one of the most curious in the whole realm of natural history and the facts are now becoming better known among other new evidence the recent intensive observations and wonderful cinematograph records of mr edgar chance have placed several points beyond doubt the cuckoo's procedure it seems to be the case that each female cuckoo has its chosen territory of operation and that deliberate choice of nests is made in advance of the date of laying when the time for laying comes the selected nest is approached the cuckoo takes an egg from the nest in its beak settles on the nest lays its own egg and then flies away with a stolen egg which it either eats or drops at a distance the whole manoeuvre takes but a few seconds and may be carried out despite the frantic efforts of the small and unwilling hosts to drive off the intruder sometimes the procedure varies for no cuckoo could lay in a wren's nest for instance and in cases of that kind the egg must be laid outside and inserted with a beak the point of principle however is that the cuckoo certainly does not fly about carrying an already laid egg and looking for a suitable nest to victimize the young cuckoo's part one cuckoo does not normally lay two eggs in the same nest but different cuckoos may chance to select the same victim if there has been an encroachment of territory once the act has been accomplished the foster parents do the rest until the eggs hatch out then begins the second part of the cuckoo's villainy for the young fondling has in its earliest and comparatively helpless days the inborn habit of removing the other chicks from the nest by getting his back under them and heaving them overboard so it happens that the foster parents are soon left with but one charge whose veracity keeps them perpetually busy and whose body speedily fills up the nest still the poor dupes go on feeding the parasite even when he is much bigger than they are one of mr chance's photographs shows a bloated young cuckoo sitting on a post when the much smaller Pippet, dutifully feeding him, must needs stand on his shoulder, so to speak, for the purpose. The whole story is one of effective adaptation on the part of the cuckoo, and of weakness, of blind instinct on the part of the foster parent. The most interesting theoretical point about the cuckoo has to do with the color of the eggs, which is very variable, but tends to be like the one of the eggs that is chosen foster mother the one hen cuckoo always lays the same type of egg seems to be thoroughly established but it is still a matter of speculation whether the character is hereditary and if so in what matter the cuckoo victimizes a large number of different species as foster parents for its young but all the usual ones are small insectivorous birds the degree to which the cuckoo's eggs resembles the others varies greatly sometimes there is almost a perfect match at least in color but in other cases the similarity is slight or even non-existent end of section eleven recording by goldie of the outline of science volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Goldie. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 12, Birds, Part 4. Migration. The scientific investigation of migration is greatly complicated by the difficulties of making observations it is not believed that the greater part of migration takes place at immense altitudes and at an accelerated rate of flight which makes enormous journeys possible for birds in a single night it remains true that a great deal of migration is nocturnal and that for other reasons also it is difficult to observe at certain times and places however much migratory flight can be actually observed we have for example this recent description of the passage of swallows on heligoland all through the forenoon as we sat in the autumn sunshine near the narrow northern apex of the island the swallows came in over the sea from the northeast in the teeth of a southerly gale 
no large flocks were seen but on the other hand scarcely a minute elapsed without the arrival of a fresh party of from a half a dozen to a score of birds they seemed to fly low over the sea but rose as they approached to the level of the cliff tops we could not make them out at any distance for the observer can find no worse background for small birds than grey moving water the stream was continuous and the direction unvarying so far as we could judge each party rose to our level on the top of the north point flew unhesitantly along the western side of the island and disappeared again at the southwestern corner not one in a hundred quitted this line or stopped to circle round none seem inclined to break their journey so early in the day in spite of the country elements the whole was for us just a momentary peep at one of the countless tiny channels by which the bird life of northern europe was then ebbing southward migration of starlings a more comprehensive idea of migration is obtainable from gatke's observation extending over the whole length of a season let us summarize the diurnal movements of starlings as observed by him on heligoland during the autumn of eighteen seventy eight early in june came a few old birds in worn plumage birds would have probably remained unmated or had early lost their broods on the twentieth june came the first great flights of young birds of the year migrating by themselves in advance of their parents although only a few weeks out of the egg these youngsters continued to pass till the end of the month to the extent of thousands daily in early july the daily passage was estimated in tens of thousands and, and on the twenty fifth the movement closed with the passage of immense multitudes two months followed during which no starlings young or old were to be seen on the twenty second september old birds now in fresh plumage passed in flights of many hundreds during october the flights increased to thousands and on the fourteenth the movement reached a climax with starlings in hundreds of thousands by the end of the month the great flights had ceased but through november and even up to the eighteenth of december the birds continued to pass in daily flights of from forty to sixty individuals lighthouse scenes nocturnal migration is also often observed at lighthouse and lightships and especially when the weather is foggy thousands of birds dazzled by the lantern rays dash themselves against the glass as gatke says the whole sky is now filled with a babble of hundreds and thousands of voices and as we approach the lighthouse there presents itself to the eye a scene which more than confirms the experience of the ear under the intense glare of the light swarms of larks starlings and thrushes career around in ever-varying density like showers of brilliant sparks or huge snowflakes driven onward by the gale and continuously replaced as they disappear by freshly arrived multitudes mingled with these birds are large number of golden plovers lapwings curlews and sandpipers now and again to a woodcock is seen or an owl with slow beating wings emerges from the darkness into the circle of light but again speedily vanishes accompanied by the plaintive cry of an unhappy thrush that has become its prey the modern method of marking with numbered aluminum foot rings has a beady added greatly to our knowledge of the actual journeys performed by individual birds by this means for instance white storks marked in the nest in east prussia have been traced south eastward across europe to syria palestine and egypt and thence up to the nile to lake victoria nyanza and also away eastward near lake chad in the very heart of africa and so southwards through rhodesia to natal the transvaal and cape colony five separate swallows marked with aluminum rings in this country have been found in south africa in winter the outline of science migrations of lapwings many birds such as lapwings or peewits marked in scotland as chicks in summer have been recovered in winter from ireland other scottish lapwings have wandered further and have been recorded from the west coast of france or from portugal in a few cases too lapwings were reported during the winter months from their native districts it is therefore evident that even within a single species in a single area there 
may be resident than migratory individuals and among the migrates some which go much further afield than others there is no doubt that many birds on their return make for their birthplace a swallow marked when it was a young one has been found thus to return to its native farmyard birds would appear to return in spring impelled by a greater urgency than in the autumn migration when we see sometimes a good deal of dallying some birds are known to make trial trips and begin their journey with short stages on the return some authorities believe there is evidence that the spring journey is more direct that short cuts are found and that haste is evident when weather conditions are very bad there it's often great loss of life the streets of towns are sometimes strewn with thousands of birds that have gone astray and have perished in the cold as many as five hundred nightingales have been gathered in a single day from one small town purpose served by migration migration must serve some good purpose and be of advantage to the species which possess the habit it is indeed an expensive habit involving the perpetuation of a complex instinct the output of a large amount of energy and the facing of great risks and a heavy mortality these factors would surely be enough to wipe out a species in the keen struggle for existence did not some great compensating advantage also accrue for the departure of many birds on the approach of winter we can perhaps see good reason probably not so much in mere cold itself but in the decrease in food supply in the freezing of ground and water and in the shortened hours of daylight in the return from the south in the spring we may see an expression of a need for expansion during the breeding season to obtain more room abundance of nesting sites and fresh sources of food supply we must distinguish carefully between reasons and causes of migration between why and how valid although the reasons given may be they do not in the least explain how the migratory habit has come to be to miss this point is to fall into the trap of imagining birds as endowed with human knowledge and intellect with the power of adopting a reasoned course of conduct based on the foreknowledge of seasonal events and on an appreciation of geographical differences causes of migration two points must strike us as being significant one is that migration is a very regular phenomenon happening year after year according to the same pattern without marked differences corresponding to annual variations in climate and showing none of the features to be expected in an emergency effort created anew each season secondly much migration takes place long before it seems to be necessary for in the british isles southward movements begin as early as july many migrants too go further than seem to be required overshooting the mild winter of the northern subtropics to find a similar climate in the summer of temperate regions of the southern hemisphere the old conclusion seems inevitable that migration is a very old habit an inborn instinct which was developed ages ago and which manifests itself year after year in a uniform manner and without any remarkably close conformity to immediate conditions for an explanation of this ancient origin of the instinct we should doubtless look to the former history of birds for some more compelling circumstance capable of initiating the habit which is still maintained some have supposed that the last glacial epoch or great ice age may have driven birds gradually southward and after a long time allowed them to return gradually northwards but during the second phase it is thought they would come north only for the summer and return in between to alternative homes they had learned to know others have imagined birds as originating in the south and gradually extending their range in search of fresh feeding grounds for the hungry mouths of the breeding season going further and further each summer but always returning in winter to the original cradle of the race if we admit that the immediate seasonal changes are insufficient in themselves to cause migration beginning so early in each autumn as it does we must yet invoke them to some extent to complete the other theory if migration is an ancient habit annually reborn there must still be some immediate factor stimulating the latent instinct 
events not in themselves of sufficient strength as causes many yet serve to release more powerful energies just as a detonator explodes the bursting charge so many subtle changes either in the seasons or perhaps in the functional cycle of the bird's life awaken the compelling instinct which causes birds to cross unknown seas and continents in accordance with some ancient plan how do migrants find their way what routes do migrants follow and how do the birds find their way we must remember here again that migration is in the main a very orderly phenomenon which takes place year after year according to the same pattern we have now evidence too that as regards summer quarters at least it is common for birds to return to the same place with great accuracy any suggestion therefore of a mere haphazard movement with a vague general direction may be dismissed as being inconsistent with the facts as we know them other points to be remembered are that much migration takes place at night and that wide stretches of open sea are habitually crossed furthermore the young of the year in many species migrate southward before the parents in the case of the cuckoo long after their parents and must thus find their way without any memories to guide them anything which lies in the experience of the race is distinct from that of the individual must in these cases be handed on by inheritance purely and not by tuition and imitation our knowledge of the routes that birds follow in their migratory flights are still very scanty hooded crows caught and marked as birds of passage in the southern eastern corner of the baltic have been shown to come from southern finland in the petrograd district of russia and to follow the coast southwards and westward as far as the north eastern corner of france black-headed gulls ringed at the same place but as nestlings have been reported from right round the coast to the bay of biscay from along the courses of the rhine and the rhone as far as the balearic isles and from along the courses of the vistula and the danube and across to northern africa in its migratory flight the whole life of a bird is raised to a higher pitch it is estimated that many birds attain a speed of fifty miles an hour and a carrier pigeon has been known to keep the rate of fifty-five miles an hour for four successive hours it is unlikely that this is often surpassed by migratory birds on long-distance flights homing the question how do birds find their way is not one which can be answered at present more must first be learned of the nature of the routes which are in fact followed by migrants of the relationship of particular summer quarters to particular winter quarters and as to whether winter quarters are as clearly defined and as accurately sought out as summer quarters are known to be it is probable however that the question may be narrowed down by the elucidation of that special acuity of the senses or whether it may be which underlies the homing capacity so well known in birds recent experiments by professor j b watson and dr k s lashley have had their subjects the naughty and sooty terns nesting on the tortugas islands in the gulf of mexico birds taken from their nests and transported by ship in close cages were shown to be capable of finding their way back home from galveston to the east or from cape hatteras to the north distances of over eight hundred and fifty miles or from intermediate points at sea entirely out of sight of landmarks of any kind in being taken northwards too the birds were removed beyond the limits of the species natural range and the absence of any previous experience in that direction was all the more certain at least therefore we must concede a very highly developed sense of direction or bump of locality and plumage courtship and mating it does not come within the scope of this work to go into the question of the general classification of birds neither can we consider in detail the characters of bird structures or of feathers and plumage a bibliography is given at the end of this chapter which will be useful for readers who wish to have more information on these interesting subjects a volume might be written on any of them we cannot pass over altogether however the nature of feathers and plumage the acquisition of feathers might have been one of great steps in the progress of birds toward their present position as the supreme flying animals par excellence 
it is indeed but to forgo another link in the evolutionary history to find that feathers are modified scales and therefore closely akin to the typical covering of reptiles let us notice too that the unfeathered part of a bird bear ordinary scales the one form as it were simply replacing the other where it is more suitable the scales on the toes are often suggestively reptilian in appearance and when there are also feathers about the toes they grow not on the scales but from between the scales from between the other scales we may indeed say to emphasize the point plumage coloration the feathers of many birds are richly colored and even those of sober hue may be very beautifully marked in some cases the colors may be due to actual pigment but in others especially blues and greens the minute physical structure of the feathers is responsible and wonderful effects of iridescence are produced brilliance of plumage is often associated with a mating season but this is far from being a general rule in some instances the male has a special breeding plumage and sometimes both sexes have this examples of each kind being found among the plovers in other cases the male has brilliant plumage for most of the year like the millard while his mate is always dull in many species on the other hand the sexes are alike and have a similar appearance all the year round this permanent plumage may be dull colored as in the song thrush op curl you wonderfully beautiful birds nevertheless or brilliant as in the kingfisher most birds that have a permanent bright plumage however are dull in their first year as is the case with the afterwards splendidly iridescent starling but in some cases such as the kingfishers and the parrots the gorgeous plumes have appeared before the birds leaving the nest one other kind of change must also be mentioned namely the seasonal change of the ptarmigan which is white during the season of snow and of duller appearance when its native hills are brown once more courtship and mating some of the most interesting habits of birds are those associated with a mating season in many cases they are curious ceremonies of courtship often with wonderful display of brilliant plumage or with great exuberance of song and sometimes there are fierce fights between rival males the peacock spreads and erects his magnificent train the argus pheasant displays long plimies on his wings as well as on his tail and the different birds of paradise glow with gorgeousness in their almost every feather many a relatively dowdy bird as judged by human eyes may also be seen posturing in much the same way as his more ornamental brethren and we must be chary of denying to any bird strange beauty in the sight of his love in the ordinary black grouse we may find a habit of display as well marked as that of any inhabitant of tropical jungles it gives indeed an example not only of individual display but also of a collective tournament in which rival black cocks strive to impress the grey hens which they wish to win as mates in scotland say the fortunate may perhaps witness a gathering of black cocks at break of day early in the breeding season the birds assemble in some open spot and indulge in the wild whirring calls that form their song of love and war and the racket may be heard two miles off then the tournament begins it may be skirmishing a display of fencing or sparring or as sometimes happens these harmless encounters may develop into fierce fights and sometimes a duel to the death at intervals during each separate fight black cocks emit a curious call it is almost a hoarse screech resembling the noise too painfully familiar to us namely that of cats on housetops supplemented by the said animals being afflicted with sore throats the sound is both wild and unmusical in the extreme we will suppose that the observer has come early on the scene before the grey hens have made their appearance the approach of one of the latter is the signal for an immediate cessation of hostilities on all sides and intense excitement prevails amongst the assembled blackcocks her approach has been observed by a single bird who has been sharper than the rest in detecting the lady afar he will suddenly draw himself up to a rigid position of attention till he is sure she is really coming having settled this in his mind to his own satisfaction 
he throws himself into the air and flutters up a few feet uttering the wild horse notes with all the power and effect he can muster this is of course known to impress the lady in his favour and arouse in her breast a proper sense of admiration which he considers his due his example is immediately followed by all the others who want a lighting dance about in the most absurd manner each one trying to see who can screech the loudest and be the most ridiculous in his antics when a hen has alighted on the playing ground the male that is nearest to her pairs with her and fights off any other that disputes her possession she then meanwhile walks sedately round her lord and master peeking about the grass coquettishly and pretending to be feeding each hen on arrival causes the same general excitement and is appropriated by one or another of the successful cocks till the harems are filled up one cock having at times as many as six or seven hens as the season advances after the first few mornings of the hens coming to the ground they resort to the same spot each day and stay with the same cock who has previously trodden them and are not interfered with afterwards by other cocks who acknowledge the superior claims of the male to whom they rightfully belong in some cases there are special aids to display such as the pouch in the neck of the great bustard which the cock can distend and will and use as an aid in the erection of his feathers pigeons too have a similar habit of inflating their crops although they lack special plumes and the frygate bird has an external pouch which itself serves as an ornament being of naked skin bright red in color and very extendable the bower birds of australasia examples could be multiplied almost indefinitely but we must here confine ourselves to one other case which has a novel feature of its own the different species of bower birds found in australasia build various types of bowers which serve as playgrounds in which the cocks court their mates these bowers are often large and complex structures of twigs or flower stems and are decorated with collections of blossom shells or brightly colored berries one species builds a little cabin some two feet high and three feet in diameter at the foot of a tree and with a wide mossy lawn in front while another makes a tunnel several feet long and completely roofed over with twigs these bowers from the birds courting grounds are quite distinct from the nests which are built in trees at a later stage fighting with rivals plays a part of varying magnitude in the loves of different birds some species are well known for their pugnacity the familiar robin for instance and in cock fighting this has been turned to account a source of human entertainment in the domestic cock and in pheasants the development of spurs as weapons of offence is well known and in some kinds of birds there are several pairs other birds fight with their wings and lapwings may be seen buffeting each other in mid-air an egyptian relative of the lapwing the spur wing plover has a weapon on its wings which is said to make a fatal result no uncommon occurrence the ruff a kind of sandpiper now numbered among the rarer english birds has a frill of feathers round the neck which is a shield of defence as well as an ornament for display in the regular tournaments which are held the females called reeves lack the distinctive adornment voice the seat of the voice in mammals is in the larynx and at top of the windpipe in birds however the vocal cords are at the foot of the windpipe in a special enlargement called the song-box or syrinx the sounds are due to the rapid passage of air over the tense cords in the course of evolution the significance of the voice has broadened out from a simple parental call it became a means of recognition of any kindred and in the course of ages it became expressive of particular emotions of joy and of fear of jealousy and of content while a certain amount of vocal ability is part of the hereditary make-up there seems little doubt that the gift requires educating the song of the first year is sometimes what one might call tentative and generalized it improves with practice and is probably helped by emulation and imitation the way in which some birds example skylarks steal snatches of one another's music suggests the importance of imitation as a factor in educating the vocal powers song 
we have spoken of song as the vocal part of the display of courtship but it would be wrong to think of it as being no more song is indeed not confined to the breeding season but the periods differ with the species the extent to which the females can sing also varies it is not possible to draw a sharp dividing line between true song and the notes which constitute the ordinary language of birds and this gives another reason for not overemphasizing the sexual significance of song the definition of song must not be too strictly confined to notes which sound musical to human ears outside the ordinary songbird group there is quite commonly found some notes or cry which is especially associated with the breeding season and which may be regarded as the equivalent of a song many of these cries seem harsh and discordant to us but others have an obvious charm at any rate in their native surroundings amid the rugged beauty of a wild moorland the weird bubbling spring call of the curlew is perhaps more appropriate music than the dainty lilt of the sweetest warbler there are other notes too which are not vocal pigeons for instance can clap their wings loudly together in flight the white stork rattles the halves of his beak like castanets and the snipe bleats or drums in springtime as we have already remarked end of section twelve fourteen of the outline of science volume two this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Goldie, The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 12. Birds, Part 3. Nesting Habits. Primitive Nesting Habits. If the earliest birds were arboreal, as we have reasons for believing, the primitive nesting sites were doubtless also in trees. The elaborate structures made by many present-day birds, however, are obviously products of a higher specialized habit, which has been evolved in the course of ages. At an earlier stage, the eggs would be laid in such natural sites as were available without the necessity of building, and modern examples of a similar habit are not wanting. A species of white tern, for instance, inhabits tropical islands and frequently deposits its single egg on the strong horizontal leaf of a palm tree. As Dr. H. O. Forbes says, the egg is laid in the narrow angular gap between two leaflets on the summit of each arc of the leaf where it rests securely without a scrap of nest. Yet defying the heaving and twisting of the leaves in the strongest winds, the leaf as in all palms goes on drooping further and further till it falls and among the settlers on cocos keeling island it is a subject of keen betting when they see a tern sitting on an ominously withered leaf whether the young bird will be hatched or not before the leaf falls the result has always been in favor of the bird if the leaf falls in the afternoon the tern will have escaped from the egg in the morning examples of birds which nest in holes and trees in accordance with a probably ancestral custom are the owls the parrots the titmice and of course the woodpeckers the imprisonment of the home bill another hole nester is the home bill of which various species are found in many tropical lands and its story is a very strange one indeed when the eggs are laid and the hen begins to sit the opening in the tree trunk is walled up with mud by the cock only until a small orifice remains through which the sitting bird can put no more than her head the device is doubtless a means of defence against snakes or other enemies but it involves the imprisonment of the hen during the whole period of incubation during this time however she is by no means left to starve but is fed assiduously through the grill by her devoted mate who is indeed set to work so hard and to forage so unselfishly that he is worn to a mere shadow of his former self before the task is done among the tree nesting birds the most primitive type of wholly artificial nest seems to be the platform of sticks or twigs made by such birds as eagles herons and pigeons these structures are often of great size being added to year after year the simplest platforms are quite flat but others are more or less cupped shaped as in the case of crows finally this type reaches its highest point in those birds which add a dome-shaped roof 
more complex structures. More promising material is used by most of the small birds which nest in trees or bushes and with pliable twigs, grasses and roots, moss and perhaps animal hair. Much more complex structures are possible. The finches, for example, make elaborate and beautiful cup-shaped nests, while others, such as the wren and the dipper, make spherical nests, which can be entered only by a small hole in one side. In addition to the actual structure, there is often a distinct lining of specially selected material for this purpose. Small feathers, hair, and fine fibers are greatly favored. But in the familiar case of the song thrush, for instance, a complete lining of hardened mud is a characteristic feature. Few nests reach such a high development as that of the tailor bird of India, so called from its habit of sewing leaves together to make a beautiful pouch, a very triumph of the nest builder's art. Burrowers From nesting in holes in trees to nesting in holes in the ground is an easy transition and the gap is bridged by the birds like the stock dove, which use either side according to the opportunities which a particular district may happen to afford. This bird gets its name from the habit of nesting in holes in the stalks of old trees, but among the sand dunes on many parts of the British coastline it uses rabbit burrows instead. In similar haunts we may also find another burrow nester, the bird which Mr. W. H. Hudson calls the strange and beautiful sheldrake. Unlike most of the duck family, the male sheldrake is not subject to an eclipse molt in the midst of breeding season, and he is therefore able to stand by his mate, who furthermore has a bright plumage similar to his own. Other birds which nest in burrows are the petrels, some penguins, the kingfisher, and the sand martin. The last name nests in colonies, and each pair of tunnels may feed into the chosen banks and hollows a little chamber at the end. The bee-eater makes a similar tunnel, which may be as much as ten feet long. As with holes in trees, a lining may be added, say of grass or other vegetation. The shell-duck, like others of its kind, uses a plentiful supply of down plucked from its own breast, while the kingfisher lines its nest with an unsavory collection of fish bones and other remains of its prey. The megapodes go to the extreme of completely burying their eggs either in pits or under specially constructed mounds. Ground Nesting very many other birds nest either on the open ground or among the long grass and herbage. Sometimes there is a well-built nest among a grass, as in the case of the skylark or the meadow pipit. At other times there may be a bulky heap of vegetation or of other material. This cormorant, for instance, often raises a mound of seaweed, and some kinds of penguin build a spartan nest of stones. Still, again, there may be a mere hollow scrapped in the ground, as in the case of the lapwing or the tern, perhaps with a lining, a pretense at a lining, or with no lining at all. Finally, the bird may lay its eggs on the ground without any attempt at a nest, as the oyster catcher does among the riverside shingle. Cliff nesting. Somewhere between the tree nesters and the ground nesters, we must place those birds which nest on cliffs, for although a nest on a rock ledge may seem in some ways very like a nest on flat ground, the dependence on inaccessibility rather than on concealment makes the habit also akin to tree nesting. Some of the borrowers, like the puffins and the petrels, might well be classed in by this group, as their holes are usually on precipitous faces, but more typical are those species which breed on the open ledges, like the guillemont and the razorbill. A highly specialized type of nest, too, is that which is built of mud against the sheer rock face for this purpose, as in the house martin. The habitations of man are often found to serve as well as natural faces of rock. Sometimes the mud and other material are made more coherent by the addition of the salivary secretion of the builders, as it, with the edible swift of Borneo. This substance, like hardened glue, forms practically the whole structure, and is the source of the bird's nest soup, beloved of the Chinese gourmet. The use of old nests. Many birds return to their old nests and use them again and again, while other kinds habitually build afresh each year. 
there are birds too which commonly use the old nests of other species or without additions of their own although they are not always incapable of building for themselves if faced with a necessity this habit is not uncommon in the case of birds of prey the kestrel for example often uses the old nests of crows and pigeons the green sandpiper belonging to a very different order of birds uses the old nests of thrushes and other tree nesting birds and even squirrels drays all most of its own kin are typical ground nesters chicks and nestlings it is impossible to leave the main question of nesting habit without some reference to the striking differences observable among the newly hatched young of birds these fall into two well-marked groups in accordance with the condition and stage of development at the date of leaving the egg technically these groups are the nidifugates and the rodicolos terms which may translate as nest quitting and nest dwelling though perhaps something of the distinction is conveyed in the two ordinary names chick and nestling the chick of domestic fowl is notoriously a nest quitter so also are ducklings whether domestic or belonging to one of the many wild species and so likewise the young of the plover kind all these birds leave the eggs prepared to take an immediate active part in life they are open-eyed and lively able to walk and in appropriate cases to swim and capable of finding their own food with no more than guidance and protection of the parent contrast these with say young thrushes helpless blind almost naked and rather repulsive looking creatures which would die miserably without the food their parents so assiduously bring the difference is indeed a most striking one but some of the nest dwelling young are not quite so unlike the more active chicks the nestlings of the birds of prey and of the owls for instance are clothed in down and are open-eyed and alert although they remain in the nest at first and are wholly dependent on their parents for food transporting the young we have an illustration of how some birds make use of their wits in the way they transport their young in this connection lord grey recently told how he watched a wood duck carolina whose nest was a hole in a tree twenty-one feet from the ground and three hundred yards from the water presently the duck flew down from the hole into the grass and began calling then one by one the little ducklings came to the edge of the hole and fell to the ground when measured the nest was found to be two feet below the hole for the newly hatched birds to climb that distance to fall twenty-one feet and then follow their mother three hundred yards to the water was i think a tremendous tribute to the energy of nature the female woodcock when threatened with danger is known to transport her young one at a time to another place she does so by carrying the young ones with her feet holding them in her claws or pressing between her thighs it is also said that where she nests at a distance from the feeding ground she will carry her young to and fro in the morning and evening the study of birds eggs we cannot here discuss fully the eggs of birds a wealth of matter for speculation lies in the why and wherefore of size and shape of texture and color and of the numbers forming a clutch all these characters show wide limits of difference but on the whole they remain very constant and characteristic for any one species size and shape of eggs the size of the individual egg is variable apart from the question of due proportion to the size of the parent bird concerned this is related in a large degree to the length of the incubation period while this in turn depends to an important extent on the state of development of the young when hatched a subject which has already been discussed in texture of shell eggs vary from the brilliantly polished egg of the tinamus to the softly chalky eggs of the cormorant from which the white outer surfaces can be scraped to show a pale blue layer beneath thickness of shell is also a variable factor apart from the mere relation to general size egg coloration it is however the color of eggs that have always attracted most attention some of these are exceedingly beautiful both in tint and in the patterns of marking blues and greens are common especially among tree nesting birds while ground nesters usually show neutral brown tones which are most effective for purposes of camouflage some splendid red tones are characteristic of the birds of prey markings may be small spots or larger blotches 
and they may be evenly distributed or concentrated in a particular zone fine lines also are found in some cases witness the buntings and in many birds there is a plain marked ground colour pure white eggs are usually found in species which nest in holes and this is perhaps of some use in the dark although the more important point is probably the absence of any occasion for an attempt at camouflage coloration coloration in many instances serve a protective purpose and generally speaking it is related to some extent to the nature of the bird's environment there are curiously no pure black eggs behavior of birds more than any other creatures birds have claimed the attention of those who are fond of what faber called scrutinizing life there is often an extraordinary subtlety as well as beauty in their habits there are big-brained animals and the senses of sight and hearing are developed to great perfection the question is how much in the behavior of birds we must ascribe to instinctive endowment that is to inborn impulsions or hereditary nervous predispositions and to what extent must we credit the bird with intelligent learning when a young moorhen swims deftly the first time it touches the water or dives perfectly when the fit and proper stimulus is forthcoming we interpret this as instinctive its physiological side is a concatenation of reflex actions its psychological side is inborn impulse and endeavor similarly when an unhatched lapwing utters its characteristic call note peewit from within the egg we say this is instinctive independent of instruction learning or imitation but a different note is sounded in the behavior of the greek eagle which lets the tortoise fall on the rocks from a great height so that the carpace is broken or in a similar device of the rook that lifts the freshwater mussel and lets it fall on the riverside stones the herring gull sometimes lifts the sea urchin or the clam in its bill and let it fall on the shingle so that the shells are broken without necessarily supposing that these birds thought out the expedient we can hardly avoid the conclusion that they utilize the discovery intelligently in many cases the bird must be credited with an appreciation of circumstances with an awareness of what is significant and what a capacity for learning the young chick's capacity for rapidly learning simple lessons mostly associations have been proved up to the hilt by many experiments in the quiet of the wood one sometimes hears the song thrush breaking snail shells on its stone anvil and one may easily find the tell-tale evidence of its appetite is this habit which comes so near using a tool an inborn gift or has it to be learned the answer is given by miss frances pitt in her admirable wild creatures of garden and header grow to a young thrush which she has brought up by hand she offered some wood snails helios nemoralis but he took no interest in them until one put out its head and began to move about the bird then pecked on its horns but was bewildered when the snail retreated within the shelter of its shell this happened over and over again the bird's inquisitiveness increased day by day the thrush often picked up by the lip but no real progress was made till the sixth day when the thrush beat a snail on the ground as it would a big earthworm at last on the same day he picked up the shell and hit it repeatedly against the stone he tried one snail shell after another until after fifteen minutes hard work he managed to break one after that all was easy he had cracked his first snail after long trying he has found out how to deal with a difficult situation we may say that while a certain predisposition to beat things is doubtless inborn the use of the anvil is no outcome of a specialized instinct it is an intelligent acquisition the general impression that one gets in regard to this cleverness of birds in such activities as nest building capturing booty and dealing with food is that on an instinctive basis varying in definiteness there is built up a superstructure partly due to easy education and subsequent imitation and partly due to an intelligent appreciation of the lessons of experience but an appreciation of the relative importance of nature and nurture requires careful observation and experiment end of section thirteen recorded by goldie